All right, everyone, thanks for coming. This is a, a lecture on evaluating contemporary originalism. I do disagree with the normal terms in which this debate is conducted, but for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to stick with uh, uh, the idea of a contrast between contemporary originalism and living constitutionalism. I'll pitch it in that way. I mean, the case book uh, follows that. Lots of people do. But the purpose of this really is more to focus on originalism rather than living constitutionalism, although I have something to say about both. So originalism, as it currently is, is a family of theories. It's not one theory, which is important in and of itself. But it's a family of theories of constitutional interpretation, stressing the use of certain kinds of historical evidence as the key to unlocking the meaning of the Constitution, and so applying it to specific cases. Now, originalists would not really favor certain aspects of that definition, but I'm emphasizing historical evidence and the importance of that definition to get us all on a, on a similar plane, a baseline that's a common baseline for analysis, uh, rather than just accepting the terms of the debate as described by originalists. So living constitutionalism is not necessarily a good name for the opposing perspective because it can be understood not as a normative perspective but as a descriptive explanatory account about how constitutional change actually occurs, especially outside of the amendment process. So originalism is this normative theory. Living constitutionalism, though, can be described or presented in such a way that it's really a description of our mm, constitutional reality. And so uh, this means that this can make it, make it hard to understand the debate back and forth. As far as a normative alternative to originalism, I contend the real alternative is simply our constitutional tradition of interpreting and applying the Constitution to concrete controversies, a tradition strongly influenced, as some scholars have urged, by the common law. This tradition, however, is not reducible to any one method, and the common law itself is a, is a collection of a variety of methods because the Constitution is a completely unique kind of law, uh, not fully analogous to any other kind of law, as its purpose is to provide a framework for politics as such and control the government rather than individuals. So that's a preface to saying quickly what the debate is not about, what the debate is about and what neither side wants to talk about, because I often get the impression they're avoiding certain subjects. Uh, what the debate is not about. It's not really being debated whether the Constitution should be adapted to new circumstances. That's not really the right focus, because everyone as a party to this debate agrees that new facts will produce new adaptations of the Constitution. It's not about whether historical evidence should be used in constitutional interpretation. This is common ground. And more controversially, it's not about the so-called dead hand problem, although this is typically featured as a site for the debate, with living constitutionalists, in effect, arguing we shouldn't pay so much attention to the Constitution as a hard law because it's governing us from a highly questionable normative past uh, where, uh, for example, lots of people were excluded from the making of the original Constitution. And we shouldn't be ruled by the dead hand of the past. But uh, I, I stand with a number of scholars in saying that argument simply goes too far. That would undermine not originalism, that would undermine our entire constitutional tradition as such. Uh, which I certainly value, but it would put in question, since it puts, puts in question constitutionalism as such, not just originalism, at that point you're talking about a completely different debate. What the debate is about then, well, my attempt to narrow it down is whether contemporary perspectives on how to determine what the law is at any given point and contemporary values concerning the content of law can be avoided when interpreting and adjudicating an old constitution. Now, that's very carefully phrased, can be avoided. Living constitutionalists might say, yes, we should use <laughs> contemporary perspectives, but I'm trying to uh, st state things a bit more neutrally and pose it more of a challenge to originalists by saying, could you completely avoid contemporary perspectives on those two things? What the law is, and contemporary values concerning uh, the content of law. 
Why does this problem arise? Um, because we've uh, deliberately pretty much avoided amending the Constitution in certain ways that are highly relevant to the legal change that has in fact occurred without amendment. So I think it's possible to argue that, in effect, we've amended the Constitution through other means, non-amendment non -amendment means. And we've done this kind of deliberately throughout our history, uh, being kind of afraid to engage in formal amendment. But this uh, commitment, which was, uh, uh, is backed up by any number of good reasons, has uh, produced a situation over time in which the Constitution sort of as enforced uh, differs quite uh, dramatically from the Constitution on the page. And this produces uh, what I call the problem of constitutional change. Now, more conventionally, that's a bit uh, perhaps a radical thought. More conventionally, the problem also arises with respect to specific clauses, the abstract clauses that everyone likes to talk about, that as scholars say, have some meaning, but generally underdetermine the meaning that we need uh, in uh, uh, specific cases. And it's also problematic how more specific clauses interact with broader doctrines like federalism and separation of powers. These all produce the real ground of the debate, what the debate is about. And what neither side wants to talk about, well, let's just keep in mind for purposes of discussion that there aren't just conservative originalists. There are plenty of liberal originalists, people, and in fact, both sides are fairly optimistic about the capabilities of our Constitution to address our general legal circumstances, however described, without uh, the need for significant uh, non-amendment change or change through amendment. So what neither side really wants to talk about is the possibility, what I would describe as the likelihood, since I'm on the, more on the constitutional reform side, the likelihood that the Constitution cannot adequately serve the American people for the rest of this century and for the future unless it is updated through constitutional reform whether through amendments or constitutional reform is a good label still to use even if for fundamental statutes uh, executing constitutional powers to restore properly functioning democratic process. That is, you could make some pretty fundamental changes to our democratic process without amending the Constitution. There's a lot of play in the joints, especially if you're talking about democratic procedures, uh, even voting rights. Um, but those would still be fundamental changes, and I, I'm calling them constitutional reform. With this in mind, let's take a look at the conventional wisdom about how to contrast living constitutionalism with originalism as a way of setting up a more specific discussion. Uh, I gave you a quote from the eminent uh, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, certainly one of the most eminent living constitutional scholars, very recently um, defining living constitutionalism as, quote, an emphasis on the evolving meaning of constitutional guarantees and a willingness to weigh the social consequences of competing constitutional interpretations, unquote. So this definition points up that living constitutionalists seem to be concerned with putting forward a vision about the role law plays in our wider society and its relation to that society. Now, I can immediately draw a pretty good contrast between that perspective, however you would describe it, and the central concerns of originalists by saying that contemporary originalists would not find anything useful or helpful or relevant in his statement. Because from their perspective, they're aiming at a completely different target, namely a proper understanding of the governing law of the US, the Constitution. And you might say for them, the text comes first. And they don't hear anything in that definition about how to approach the text. Therefore, that is, uh, it's orthogonal to their concerns. And that's uh, a source of perhaps some of the slippages in the debate, uh, because Professor Tribe would think that the, the definition is relevant. So originalists emphasize, first, the fixity of the original public meaning of the Constitution unless it is changed by a valid amendment, which pl stra places tremendous stress on exactly how we determine 
that original public meaning. And you read Heller, and Heller is viewed as one of the chief examples of how you go about it. So as a practical demonstration, you read one of the leading examples of how to do it. Second, though, original public meaning is uh, uh, characterized by the use of certain kinds of historical evidence and not others. And this is very well illustrated by the debate in Heller between Scalia and Stevens. I have to tell you that many journalists and commentators were totally puzzled by the historical arguments used by Scalia and Stevens. How could it be the case that they were looking at historical evidence, both of them, but coming up with two completely different arguments, diametrically opposed conclusions. How could that even be explained? Um, I think some people do remain puzzled by that. But you can, we can take an advance toward understanding by uh, seeing that for Scalia, pursuing original public meaning is like a telescope to the past, emphasizing certain things and not others. And by his method, much of the evidence cited by Justice Stevens is simply irrelevant. It's irrelevant. He's defined his task so that only certain kinds of evidence are relevant to the, uh, the public meaning of the Constitution, roughly. It's roughly like Scalia only thinks that the dictionary definitions of, of words like keep and bear arms are relevant where Stevens is looking to purpose and a purpose why the Second Amendment was adopted. But the original, the idea, so the thesis of, the, of relying on original public meaning is a very particular one, treating the past as if it was a giant dictionary. Now it's not. There are some dictionaries in the past, but there, there's a problem there. There's no you know, generally accepted dictionary for, of American usage, for example, in the 18th century. So in effect, original public meaning uh, scholars have to construct one. And what you're, one of the things that's going on in the Scalia opinion is he's constructing what a dict, sort of the ideal dictionary. And he's referring then to it to uh, establish the meaning of the phrases, and then that's the binding law. Everything else is either secondary or irrelevant. So he's using a, an argument which makes irrelevant most of Stevens's evidence, and that's why I concentrate on the importance of having historical evidence as the baseline, and then seeing exactly which historical evidence people think is most relevant. All right, that's always an issue in the background. That's not something, though, they necessarily f tell you up front. Third point is originalists further hold that this meaning should constrain constitutional interpretation and adjudication in the present. Now, there are some other aspects to originalism I briefly summarized that, I th that aren't necessarily part of the formal theory, but I think are really important to sort of getting where originalists are coming from today. So I'm going to briefly go through them. First, everyone concedes um, that there are very abstract or underdetermined provisions in the Constitution. But originalists are generally unwilling to concede that this is the case before they go through, as it were, their project of determining the original public meaning of each clause that's at issue. And I have to tell you, they've only just started. <laughs> so they're not really, we're not really in a position to uh, concede, and they typically don't, that some uh, clauses are just too abstract to be filled by content from the past. So there may well be gaps and vagueness in the Constitution, but contemporary originalists are simply less willing to concede that this is true as compared, perhaps, to originalists in the past. Uh, second, they have an attitude I call this far but no further. Originalists generally aren't that interested in talking about how their method might lead to the overruling or downplaying of fundamental past precedents. But that's because they've adopted more of a practical attitude here where they're not actually interested in overruling necessarily any of the important precedents of the past, although there are probably some that are in their sights 
but the Second Amendment is more illustrative, illustrative of where they've been coming from in the past couple of decades, where that's a clause that was simply not really well interpreted. There's not much, wasn't much case law on it. And so it was never really interpreted the right way from their perspective. And so Heller restarts, uh, restarts a proper rule of law inquiry there. They like to do maybe the same thing on other clauses, but their attitude toward precedent is more like the uh, saying, we're not that interested in questioning fundamental precedents, but going forward, all interpretation going forward is going to be based on original public meaning. So that's this far, but no further. It's as some scholars have already pointed out, that's a bit inconsistent because you're saying that your method would indict some past cases. You're not willing to overrule them, but going forward, uh, they're quite serious about applying their method. But inconsistent or not, that tends to be their stance. Furthermore, fundamental precedents like Brown versus Board of Education, seen as untouchable or normatively worthy, have in effect been grandfathered in to originalism. This is part of what I call optimistic originalism. Unlike some of the material you have in their book, uh, the uh, originalists today are pretty optimistic that Brown and other cases that were questioned in the past for being consistent with original meaning or original intent uh, are really that inconsistent. So they, they think they can explain them, which leads to the suspicion that originalists are solving problems like this with their theory by fiat or by selecting evidence carefully. Now, these can suggest some of the issues with contemporary originalism, but there's a ground level reality operating here, which another aspect you could say of contemporary originalism, which is they don't really see what the possible alternative might be. Uh, that's why I emphasize they wouldn't get anything out of Professor Tribe's quotation. They have a really hard time seeing what the alternative is, which is one reason why I constantly emphasize uh, the importance of our tradition. And it's furthermore, it can be hard to understand this theoretical debate as everyone is using historical evidence. Well, originalists are often, I think, subtly equivocating between adopting a mode of interpretation used by everyone, everyone relies on evidence from the past and in interpreting the Constitution, and saying that a particular version of that method, original public meaning, is the sole legitimate method of interpretation. That's where Scalia is coming from in his Heller opinion, which is far, far more controversial. This observation is by way of suggesting the current debate is somewhat unproductive because there are significant slippages between originalists and their opponents. And here I suppose I'm coming to the heart of what I want to get across to you today. One slippage is over what's been called the thin theory of public meaning, as advocated by Yale Law School professor Jack Balkin in a very good book, a book I'd recommend to anyone uh, really interested in constitutional law, really interested in drilling down. It's called Living Originalism. It was published about 10 years ago. Uh, Balkan made a lot of news as a liberal by saying he was an originalist. But what he meant was that the binding law that originalists are so concerned with only extended to what you might call the literal or semantic meaning of each provision. Now, if you're wondering whether that theory would constrain uh, uh, or tell you a lot about the meaning of abstract clauses, including the one we've been spending time on, the Equal Protection Clause. The thin theory do doesn't, because the literal or semantic meaning of equal protection of the laws today pretty much is exactly what it was when it was passed. It's something about focusing on protection of the laws and doing it equally, and there's not much more content than that. Now, what Balkan wants to claim is, as far as binding law, we should be bound. Uh, we're not only to the specific phrases that everyone does rely on, and we do want those presidents to leave office after four years, don't we? Uh, and that's an example of a specific clause everybody relies on. But I, I can give you more examples that are a little more abstract, like high crimes and misdemeanors. Everyone cared about the historical evidence about what that meant, too. So let's just not think that, again, historical evidence is not only the preserve of originalists. But 
Balkan's idea was that the binding quality of the Constitution extends only to its very simple, straightforward, literal meaning. That doesn't say much about filling out the abstract provisions, but that's Balkan's point. He has another theory, another part of the theory, helps you then fill out, and that part of his theory resembles strongly what living constitutionalists say about that tribe quotation, about taking into account evolving meanings and so on. Now, most everyone does actually accept the idea of semantic meaning as a starter or baseline, but the critical issue is whether contemporary originalism would require more than this as binding law. It's very telling that originalists, this is a very prominent you know, book and a theory, originalists did not accept Balkan's, in, Balkan's invitation to say, yes, originalism comes down to the thin theory of meaning. But that refusal to accept means that they're filling their theory with greater content than just semantic meaning based on their historical investigations into the original public meaning of the 14th Amendment or whatever clause that we're talking about. But that search then for a more determinate more full account of what each clause means, that's what produced the conflict uh, over originalism in the first place, or more point pointedly, that's what produced the whole point of view known as living constitutionalism. Because over time, people came to feel that we shouldn't be tied down to certain things that were definitely the law, part of the constitutional law in the past, but gradually over time lost their legal force. Now, believe it or not, you've studied a really good example of this process, but this is an example I only realized the relevance of relatively recently. This is the distinction in Plessy versus Ferguson between civil, political, and social rights. I have to tell you this distinction was a super popular in the 19th century, and it was constantly featured in the debates over the 14th Amendment. So it's not just something that Plessy came up with. It had been around for most of the 19th century. Now, this uh, distinction between civil, political, and social is directly relevant to the originalist controversy over Brown and specifically whether the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, required equality and no segregation in schools. The NAACP lawyers in Brown had a real problem when they did historical investigation because they came up with these specific quotes most of them, I believe, in the context of talking about the 1866 Civil Rights Act, where people said, well, this is a norm of equality, but it's not going to apply to schools. There's actually an explanation for why they would have accepted out schools, which is schools were viewed as related to family, and family was part of social rights, not political or civil. So you could make a case that we're dividing rights up equally, but the civil rights we're dividing up equally have nothing to do with social rights, and education is best slotted in the social area. Now, as far as I know, no historian has really uh, drilled into why the distinction between civil, political, and social rights fell by the wayside, but it's obvious that it did. And it did for reasons that living constitutionalists are perfectly familiar with. It didn't start to line up with how society thought about those kinds of subjects, including voting rights in the 20th century, which were pegged down a level at, on the political level, and education. So Warren, Chief Justice Warren is reporting reality when he tells you that in our world, in the mid-century of the 20th century, education is not only more important in some general sense, and I have to tell you that plenty of people thought it was important in the middle of the 19th century as well, but the legal structure, the legal framework in which those questions were, were analyzed were completely different because you ask people whether access to education is in effect a civil right, they're most likely to say yes in the mid 20th century because that distinction of where, where to slot it, civil, political, social, that had vanished. That had vanished. Now you see, the distinction here between civil, political, and social 
it's either part of the law when the 14th Amendment was passed, part of constitutional law, or it was not. Uh, the tremendous weight of evidence says it was part of the law. It was part of constitutional law. So it's either part of the originalist binding law or it's not. Now, if you say it's not because things have changed since then, you're in the world of living constitutionalism. Welcome aboard. But if you say, if you're committed to things that they thought back then, were part of original public meaning, part of binding law, then you are committed to somehow re-inscribing re it, re-carrying it into the present. That's an impossible project, but that's the originalist project. And they haven't made, a, made it around to explaining why, if they reject the thin theory, why don't they have to accept all of the uh, theoretical and doctrinal baggage that was part of the deliberations over the 14th Amendment? It was the common uh, understanding of nearly everyone. Not everyone agreed. You know, some people uh, got off the boat and said this distinction, civil, political, social, doesn't make any sense. But they were clearly in the minority. There's a reason why Plessy relies on the distinction. Everybody relied on the distinction. So that's both a way of defending what Warren was saying, that uh, he could have said much more uh, directly that this whole idea that education shouldn't be distributed equally, that's a vestige of this distinction between civil, political, and social rights. But that involves conceding that as an essential element of the doctrine of the past can vanish over time if conditions change. That's what Professor Tribe is talking about. But there's, so there's a slippage there. Originalists don't want to commit either way. They don't want to really address the thin theory, but they don't want to address what would happen to what their commitments would be if they accepted that we have to look at what the original public meaning was. The original public meaning of equal protection included the civil, political, social distinction. Any attempt to deny that is removing you from the history of the mid-19th century. That's not what originalism is supposed to do. A second big slippage in the theory has to do with the otherwise sound distinction between just interpreting a provision often in the abstract, and applying it in a concrete case. Originalists have popularized a uh, terminological difference here. They call the first thing interpretation and the second thing construction. But whether you accept those terms or not, it's widely agreed on that these are two different things. Determining what you might call the baseline meaning of a provision and then applying it in an actual case. Originalists often stress the ability of their theory to produce sound interpretations without saying that this may be of only very limited value in adjudicating actual cases. But it's in adjudicating actual cases, that's the terrain where living constitutionalism arose in the first place. Now, a really good example is what happens in Heller. As you get further and further along in Scalia's opinion, and he starts taking up whether specific measures now on the books like perhaps denying guns to mentally ill people, is consistent with his interpretation of the Second Amendment. Suddenly, the clarity apparently provided by the interpretive theory of original public meaning is replaced by kind of a lot of hemming and hawing about what this would mean in practice. He's not sure or he's sure that uh, recognizing an individual right to keep and bear arms won't put in jeopardy a wide range of statutes. How does he know this? Does he know this on the basis of original public meaning, or is he just now make, making it up? But that's the terrain where living constitutionalists are concerned with, especially with the idea that some of our laws today with respect to gun control, gun rights, have no real analogies to anything that was going on in the 18th century, and therefore there are distinct limits on how much a discussion of the individual right to keep and bear arms can actually help us in adjudicating these really important actual cases. One thing about the 18th century, well, there are any number of 18th century, uh, things about the 18th century, you know, no super destructive weapons, no police forces. There are multiple key normative differences uh, 
where these differences don't have any analogs in the past, and thus there isn't any obvious way to analyze their constitutionality, except by recognizing that things have changed so much that the individual right might have to be different as well. That's the issue then of pra the practical effect of abstract interpretations is what led some scholars and jurists in the first place to living constitutionalism. And originalism in the Scalia version is actually not much help resolving the cases right in front of us today as far as gun control. I would also add that theories that stress uh, how communication between generations over vast periods of time are plausible, and they clearly are plausible because we are reading the text and understanding it, certainly to an extent, can only take us so far, in my view, because in the end, the Constitution is not like ordinary speaking. It's not like the interpretation of this lecture. It's an unconventional utterance written and legitimated by bodies of people collectively rather than by individuals. And you notice how much stress at times Scalia and some of the other justices put on what certain particular people say but I have to tell you that no one ever gave any particular person the authority to speak for the convention or anyone else. That's the collectivity problem raising its head. And this remains a crucial source of interpretive difficulties, especially with the 14th Amendment, where there were particular people who said very helpful things about Section 1, but only one or two or three, not the collectivity which legitimated the amendment. Now, that seems very critical, so I want to turn this around at the end and provide some positive thoughts about how constitutional interpretation should and must occur, rather than just saying, hey, there are problems with originalism. The Constitution, I think, is best understood as what you might call a layered text. Different parts laid down over time, and there's no conventional theory of interp legal interpretation, nowhere not in the 18th century, not even today, that tells us especially how to integrate text we later adopted into an original text. I mean, there are uh, scholarly theories, but there's no conventional wisdom among jurists in our constitutional tradition because it's a deeply hard problem. In other words, that's the problem uh, even the jurists after the Civil War had with integrating, especially the 14th Amendment, into the prior order. Lots of people think they made mistakes, like in the slaughterhouse cases. But I have to tell you I have a new appreciation for just how hard the task was because it was far from obvious how much they should change the federal system. Uh, based on just the text of section, section 1. They thought the federal system as established by the framers in the 18th century should be carried forward, and I have to tell you there are a lot of people on the Supreme Court today who have exactly the same opinion. So it's, it's not an easy thing to know how to integrate past uh, the new text into past text. In addition, the text is accompanied by doctrines to make sense of it, like the distinction among civil, political, and social rights. Doctrines that are interwoven with the rest of American law and thus can fall out of favor when the background, laws cha uh, background law changes. You know, living constitutionalists aren't so much saying, let's adopt this theory. It's really good. It's not a normative proposal in, in, on balance. It's saying this is our reality that we're living in. It's a door we've walked through. There's no unlocking, there's no re revisiting that door. So we want to say something positive about staying with our tradition, a tradition which in fact includes living constitutionalism. And I have just briefly suggested what that means. It means taking all parts of the Constitution, all 27 amendments, having the same legal status, taking them equally seriously as the original text. This is something arguably scholars and jurists have uh, frequently failed to do. There's another scholar at Yale, Reva Siegel, who has uh, proposed something called synthetic interpretation. She makes an example of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Her point is, if there was anything in the prior Constitution which tended to devalue 
the contributions of women, especially in the political process. And to the extent any interpretations of the 14th and 15th Amendments, or any, or any prior part of the Constitution, or any prior part of American federalism was influenced by the idea that women are not full citizens because they don't have the right to vote, all of those assumptions with respect to all of those earlier clauses must be audit, audited in effect, reviewed and changed once you adopt the 19th Amendment. So the 19th Amendment and any similar amendments giving people the right to vote who didn't have the right to vote before are not just discrete changes saying you couldn't vote before, now you can. They are alterations to the structure of American constitutionalism if uh, voting was perceived as relevant to any other part like citizenship and therefore requires a different understanding. Similarly, many more scholars have argued that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were massive changes to American federalism. And therefore, any account of American federalism that just stays in the 18th century is defective. You have to take into account the how we changed federalism, and not only in those amendments, but in the 17th Amendment, for example, uh, with, with pertaining to the direct election of senators as well. So, Living constitutionalism can turn out to be about valuing every part of the Constitution, but also emphasizing that since uh, these earlier parts of the Constitution depended on doctrines, like the civil, political, social distinction, doctrines not in the text, other adopted amendments, later adopted amendments, can change the influence of those doctrines and change our view of what the earlier text meant has to be integrated together, and I think the efforts of various scholars have shown that's not an easy task, which is one reason perhaps uh, we haven't taken it on. Now suppose we try to say something a little more about living constitutionalism that makes it more uh, comprehensible. I'll end, I think, with uh, uh, this quote from Professor Tribe that I think I gave you from the same article. He wrote, quote, what's at stake is the difference between believing that social and cultural change tends naturally toward deterioration and division, he has in mind Justice Scalia, <laughs> there, and thus is best held at bay with rigid legal rules, yep, that's Scalia again, and believing that such decay is the result of rules that fail to evolve. Well, that's a real deep point that goes pretty much to the heart of why some people count themselves as living constitutionalists. If rules don't evolve, you've put in danger the whole structure. If they don't evolve, now you could say evolve with what? Um, Scalia always made fun of the idea of morphing along with the entire society. But lots of legal historians have shown that it's more complicated than that. It's not just society influencing law, it's contemporary law that influences society. It's a dualistic dialogue, it's a trade-off, it's a trade trades being made back and forth. It's a discussion or dialogue back and forth. It's not just one-sided where we're looking to society to tell us how to change the law. We might not want to change the law, but it's a dialogue because if you don't change at all, that puts, uh, arguably puts in play, uh, and, and in a bad way, the whole structure. As a constitutional reformer, I certainly think that's what's going on with respect to the democratic process writ large, even though there are lots of changes you could make without the amending the Constitution. But uh, we've skated by, certainly for a, with respect, again, to issues like the voting, process, voting rights and the democratic process, we've skated along for a very long time, uh, avoiding making amendments other than uh, extending the right to vote and fixing certain particular problems like poll taxes and the timing of elections. Uh, but we haven't addressed at a broad, at a deeper level uh, the issue of voting rights through amendment, and I, I think that's hurt us. But that's just one person's opinion about how to spin out living constitutionalism. Professor Tribe, I think, does capture the idea that some people are comfortable applying the rules in the belief that any other method will lead to decay or disaster. Sure, that's Justice Scalia. And others are convinced doing that and sticking rigidly in, in effect to what the 18th century said 
for example, about guns, would only leave us unable to deal with the very real problems we have with uh, armed violence in the present. Now that's just one example. Tribe is referring to a range of examples across, our con across, across the constitutional text where the, there, there's a choice between uh, enforcing a vision from the past or making accommodation at, as Warren did in Brown to change realities produced not just by society, but by changed law. Again, the civil, political, social distinction, that was part of what was behind people's failure in the 19th century to realize that equal protection should be applied to schools. But by Warren's time, it was far more plausible, should be extended, because the whole distinction, the whole idea of putting education down at some lesser level didn't exist anymore. And so it was completely plausible where he was saying that education is the foundation of citizenship. I believe everybody nodded at that in the 1950s, and presumably they would still nod at that today. So with that, I think I'll draw that to a close. I could always say more about this debate. Thanks for listening.